All right. You guys, we're here for a conversation about hypertension and the drugs to treat it. So hypertension is the most common cardiovascular disorder affecting, you can see, one in three Americans and contributing to somewhere in the neighborhood of 350,000 deaths annually. Um, my uh, Hypertension kind of can get classified from mild to moderate to severe, and um, the treatment of each of those is going to be different. So tr traditionally, uh, mild hypertension can be modified by, by lifestyle changes, um, diet and exercise primarily. Um, but as we move from mild to moderate and moderate to severe, that's when there might be the need to intervene with drugs. And so that's kind of what we're going to be focusing our conversation on are the drugs for hypertension. And there's a lot of them, as I'm sure you know, if you've looked in your textbook. So um, essentially, when we think about blood pressure, so blood pressure at the very basic level is the force of the blood that's exerting or the force of the blood that's pushing on the walls of the vessel. So essentially how much force is being applied to the walls of the vessels by the blood itself. Um, so the factors that can affect blood pressure, of course, are her cardiac output which is how much blood is actually coming out of the heart. And that's calculated by multiplying stroke volume, the, the volume of blood ejected per beat, and the heart rate, or how many times that beat, heart beats per minute. And that's how you calculate cardiac output. As cardiac output goes up, um, uh, blood pressure would increase. If cardiac output was low, blood pressure would decrease. Um, a really important factor is the diameter of the arterioles. If you recall, um, your physiology and your specifically your circulatory physiology the place where we have the most play if you will in terms of uh, total peripheral resistance is the arterioles so the arterioles are have a fair amount of smooth muscle and they also have uh, uh, receptors that are hit by the sympathetic nervous system and with sympathetic stimulation we see an increase in the in the stimul in the um uh uh, I can't come up with the word I'm thinking of. Um, we, we see the sympathetic receptors being hit, namely the, the most prominent ones are the alpha receptors, but there's some beta stimulation that beta receptors that can be hit as well. Um, with alpha stimulation, we see a constriction of the vessel or vasoconstriction. With, in the absence of sympathetic, sympathetic stimulation, we would see vasodilation. Remember, the arterioles are one of the places that are one of the very few places that are not duly innervated. So arterial diameter is a big player in blood pressure. And the more constricted the vessel, the more resistance, the resistance to flow and the higher the blood pressure. So constricting vessels would increase blood pressure. Vasodilating or dilating vessels would decrease blood pressure. And then the other variable is, of course, how much fluid is in there to begin with. The more fluid in the system, the more the fluid's going to push on the walls, which would increase blood pressure. And a decrease in fluid would decrease blood pressure. So let me flip back for a second. So our drugs are going to ultimately plug into this idea somewhere. We'll have drugs that vasodilate. We'll have drugs that um, slow the heart down and or decrease contractility. And we'll have drugs that... Um, affect the fluid. And then there's going to be some that have some overlay in one or two of those categories. All right, so there's a, there's it's not easy to know when to treat and when not to treat people with hypertension. And this is kind of a, a, a topic that's up for debate among practitioners. Um, this is, I think, pretty reasonable. Uh, and what we see here is the... so. Um, blood pressure, normal blood pressure is defined as 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. Um, most people would agree that 140 over like 90 would be considered uh, hypertensive. There's some people that like to get excited somewhere around the 135 over 85 or 90 as well, or that would be in my mind um, considered prehypertensive. So if you look at this slide, you see that there are um, different ways to kind of think about this. And 
you know, we waffle back and forth in terms of where where we would think about intervening because, of course, hypertension is hugely damaging to many things, uh, many systems, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So what we think about here is that different ages and different um, factors will determine whether or not we should think about intervening or how we should think about intervening. So if you look over here, we have age 60 or greater that do, without diabetes or chronic kidney disease. That's what that CKD stands for. Their blood pressure goal would be less than 150 over 90. And um, if you were to intervene, you would, in a non-African American person, you would start with maybe a diuretic, an ACE inhibitor, an angio um, an uh, angiotensin receptor blocker or maybe a calcium channel blocker. You can see we have different treatments for the, the non-African American and the African American and that is because for whatever reason um, blacks respond differently and so they are going to respond better to either a just a diuretic or the combination of a diuretic and a calcium channel blocker. We'll talk more about that later. You can kind of see here, a younger age 59 or lower, still without diabetes or chronic kidney disease, we'd like to see them under 140 over 90. And we would like, and if not, then our first line drugs are going to be kind of the same right here. Same with all ages that have diabetes, but no chronic kidney disease, we want to get that blood pressure under 140 over 90, same intervention. And then all ages with chronic kidney disease, with or without diabetes, we have, um, so these are a little bit more specific to kidneys. So we're kind of come back to some of this, this is just a way to think about this. Um, all right, so I said earlier that the blood pressure, normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. Um, as of the most recent data I could find, there is a group called the JNC8 that kind of outlines guidelines frequently and in the 2013 guidelines, the JNC8 defined hypertension as 140 over 90 milligrams of mercury. Um, but again, not everybody with that reading needs treatment. And that sort of was a departure from the previous um, statement, which was everyone should be treated. So our normal target range is 130 over 85. That's what we'd like to see, ideally. And um, if you get this early enough, my lifestyle modifications may be enough to get that, get you into that target zone, if you will. So the reason why we care about hypertension, and it's kind of an interesting situation, there's so many hypertensive people, and one of the reasons why it's kind of difficult and why it, it is such a problem is because it doesn't oftentimes produce very many symptoms, or any, in many cases. It doesn't hurt, you know, it doesn't cause any real problems, and so people tend to either ignore it or, or even if they know they have it, they're not particularly interested in doing a whole lot of stuff about it, especially if it requires a, some radical lifestyle changes. At least that's been my experience. So the reason why we care is because hypertension damages a whole bunch of stuff. It's hugely damaging to the vasculature. Right? So the walls of the vessels get damaged with that pressure. Um, oftentimes as the pressure increases, we create more of a turbulent blood flow rather than that nice smooth laminar blood flow, which causes damage to the endothelium and can lead to all kinds of other issues, anywhere from atherosclerosis to you name it, a whole bunch of vascular damage. Um, the, when the pressure is high in the vessels, what that means is that the heart's going to have to work harder to push against that pressure. So that can put a huge amount of pressure on the heart and can set the heart up, that set that patient up for heart failure, you know, damaging the left ventricle, getting the cardiac remodeling that we talked about with the hyper heart failure videos. Um, another thing that we know is that the coronary arteries are specifically susceptible to heart hypertension. And hypertension when present really ac accelerates coronary artery disease, which is going to put them at an increased risk for a heart attack. Um, in the brain, we are worried with hypertension, and this is a big issue. Longstanding hypertension tends to cause um, vascular damage everywhere, including the vessels of the brain, and it can lead to occlusion of the small vessels, which can precipitate transient ischemic attacks and potentially strokes. 
kidneys are susceptible as well. The da small damage of the kidneys, the part of me, small arteries of the kidneys also were damaged, decreasing renal function, and the eyes are another target, which uh, in the eyes we see small like micro hemorrhages um, due to the vasculature being um, damaged and um, retinal damage can lead to blindness. So all of these are these are the main targets, right? So the heart, the increasing the risk for heart fist, uh, heart failure, the coronaries increasing the risk of stroke, the brain transient ischemic attacks. I, I meant to say with the coronary, sorry, myocardial infarction, with the brain transient ischemic attacks and strokes and kidney damage. So and blindness. So all of that is these are all reasons why we should care about hypertension. And this is one of the reasons why we have so many of these issues, um, because oftentimes people don't know or don't start paying a lot of attention until some of these other symptoms that would have been able to be um, bypassed, if you will, had we gotten involved a little bit earlier. All right, so it's a pretty complex disease with a whole bunch of potential causative factors. So when we think about um, hypertension, oftentimes it gets kind of classified into one of two ways. Primary or essential hypertension, oftentimes also referred to as idiopathic, which is 80% or 85 or more percent of people with hypertension have this kind. And what that essentially means is you cannot link it to another organic disease. So if somebody does not have kidney disease or they don't have an adrenal tumor or something along those lines and they have hypertension and you can't find anything else organic wrong with another organ system that can explain the hypertension, we would call that primary or essential hypertension. That doesn't mean that you can't find a cause for it. You just can't find a You can't blame it on another organ, I guess you could say. Um, secondary hypertension is just that. Um, and it, it's where you can find another organic cause that's causing the, high, the blood pressure to go up. For example, hyperthyroidism, or let's say an adrenal tumor that's causing them to, to secrete a whole bunch of norepinephrine, you know, and hitting all these alpha receptors, etc. So these are um, examples of conditions that would potentially cause hypertension. So the hypertension can be explained, and in which case, we can call that secondary hypertension. So the, hyper, the hypertension, the elevation in the blood pressure is secondary to an organic problem. But as you can see, there's not, that's a much smaller percentage of patients that are actually af affected by secondary hypertension. Primary is much, much more common. And we also can't forget about drugs. People who are on other different types of drugs, um, those drugs can cause uh, the blood pressure to escalate. So I picked a few common ones. Um, oral contraceptives and estrogens can cause an increase in blood pressure. And of course, the corticosteroids can do it pretty significantly. And there's other drugs that would could do it. Um, you know, uh, drugs sometimes that are used for allergies can do it for certain people that are susceptible. Um, so there's um, nasal sprays, these kinds of things that we talked about previously in the semester. So that's kind of a just a general idea of how to sort of break this down when we look at it. All right, so there are a lot of drugs, 11 different classes of medications for hypertension. Um, this this uh, visual kind of tells us, sort of divides the first line from the second line. And so the first line ones are the ones we're going to spend more time talking about um, because they're used or more, they're more frequently and they're used earlier and they're used oftentimes on their own. And then we might have to, if we can't get the blood pressure under control, might have to start adding in some of these other agents. So the first line drugs are diuretics. Diuretics are still considered the first line medication for most cases of hypertension. And they're just gonna decrease the fluid volume, which of course would decrease the pressure. Um, the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs, the ACE angiotensin converting inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers, those drugs are gonna be almost interchangeable. And they are considered now first line drugs as well as the calcium channel blockers, depending on the patient. The second line drugs are going to be the alpha one, alpha two, and the alpha one adrenergic. Um, pardon me, the alpha two adrenergic agonists. Those are going to work centrally, and I'll explain those briefly. Um, alpha one blockers. Those are going to block the alpha receptors at the smooth muscle of the arterioles, so they're going to vasodilate. Beta blockers, of course, are going to block the beta receptors of the beta one receptors of the heart, and maybe the beta two receptors as well. 
We have more centrally acting drugs that are going to act at the brain level, central nervous system level, to, to block alpha and beta receptors peripherally. And we have direct acting vasodilators that are going to act like the alpha receptors, but leaving the sympathetic nervous system out of it. Direct renin inhibitors. And there are also some peripherally acting neuron blockers, adrenergic neuron blockers. So those are, aren't going to be super common, but they do have some utility and we'll talk about them. So here's a little visual um, that you can kind of see what I just talked to you about. Starting at the top, the alpha-2 agonists. Again, they are central nervous system drugs. They're, the alpha-2 receptor is kind of a funny one. Um, so when, you, when the alpha-2 receptor is stimulated, the alpha-2 receptor is a presynaptic neuron. And when it's stimulated, it causes a... a, a essentially causes a decrease in the sympathetic impulses that are going to leave the central nervous system. So it has a, a, a net effect of essentially blocking sympathetic stimulation peripherally, even though it starts off centrally. The alpha-1 blockers are going to block the sympathetic activation of the arterioles, causing vasodilation. The direct vasodilators are going to kind of do the same thing, but they're not going to get involved with the sympathetic nervous system. They're going to instead act, act directly on the smooth muscle of the arterioles, leaving the sympathetic nervous system out. Calcium channel blockers are going to block calcium ion channels in arterial smooth muscle, which will cause vasodilation in this context. Um, angiotensin receptor blockers here and the ACE inhibitors. So these guys are going to be more or less the same clinically, and they are both going to cause vasodilation. Um, the ACE inhibitors are going to also block aldosterone release, which will decrease fluid volume. The diuretics are first-line drugs. They're going to decrease urine, or they're going to increase, I should say, urine output by decreasing um, fluid volume. And the beta blockers are going to act directly on the heart, ideally beta-1 selective, decreasing heart rate, decreasing contractility, and reducing cardiac output. All right, so the drugs are broken down different ways, and the way that it's done in your text is divided into basically three broad classes. The first being the autonomic modifiers. Those are going to affect the heart and the blood vessel diameter by blocking the sympathetic nervous system. So these are going to block either alpha and or beta or both receptors. The non-autonomic inhibitors of smooth muscles, these ones are going to vasodilate directly. Um, that's where the ACE inhibitors, sorry, there's a typo on that slide. That's where the ACE inhibitors, the angiotensin receptor blockers, and calcium channel blockers plug in. And then there's the diuretics. Um, the drugs that are going to act centrally, I should have probably thrown them up here because they do modify the autonomic nervous system, but they do it higher up. So those are the central nervous central nervous system agents. All right, so um, I will continue with this video and then I'll stop after this one and pick it up again. So the autonomic modifiers, these are gonna again affect both the cardiac output and peripheral resistance. So I want to talk first about the alpha one adrenergic antagonist or the alpha one blockers. Um, these are gonna basically be working by lowering blood pressure because they're going to directly block the alpha receptors in the arterioles. But the alpha receptors, when they're hit, if you remember, by norepinephrine or epinephrine, they vasoconstrict. So when you block them, you're going to see vasodilation. They also vasodilate, they also vasodilate in the venous system, which lowers blood pressure by decreasing the venous return and reducing cardiac output. So these drugs will work and they will bring down the blood pressure, but they will do it really well. And for that reason, they're not really considered first line drugs. And essentially anything that's, that reliably and significantly decreases blood pressure right away, as soon as you give it, what happens is that sudden drop in cardiac output and blood pressure will send a reflex message back up to the brain, which will send an outgoing sympathetic message. So it's basically reflex sympathetic stimulation of the heart, which can cause the heart rate to increase, which would cause the blood pressure to go up. The other thing is when the blood pressure drops significantly quickly, when somebody moves from a lying to a sitting or a sitting to a standing position, oftentimes what can happen is that can cause their um, they don't. They can't generate enough pressure because of the alpha blockade, 
to get the blood pressure up, the, you know, the blood pressure naturally increases when you move, you know, transiently, when you move, you know, change positions. And when they can't accommodate for that, what they'll get is this um, symptom called orthostatic hypotension, which means they're basically hypotensive when they go from lying to sitting or sitting to standing or even probably worse, lying to standing. And that can make them dizzy. It can cause them to faint. So, and, and it's pretty significant with these drugs initially. So that's called the first dose phenomenon. So it's like the first time they take it, the blood pressure comes way down because they're reliably vasodilating everything, veins and arteries, arterioles. And they are going to have this transient period of pretty significant orthostatic hypotension, which can limit the utility of these drugs. There's also some other um, kind of symptoms that are pretty standard with with antihypertensive medications weakness dizziness dry mouth headache um, gi complaints usually nausea and vomiting um, because these will bring the blood pressure down so quickly and so reliably they can also have a pretty negative effect on sexual function particularly in men so we'll see a, a significant decrease in libido and um, also uh, oftentimes erectile dysfunction so that's something good to know and to note and to inform your patients of if you do choose to use these drugs. And keeping in mind, you know, someone that's at risk for, for a fall with, the, with this first dose phenomenon, you know, really keep that in mind. All right, so alpha-1 blockers are not first-line therapy for those reasons we just went through. Now we have the beta blockers, the beta adrenergic um, antagonists. So um, remember, we have two different types of beta receptors, preferably beta 1s and beta 2s. Ideally, we would choose a drug that's more beta 1 selective. Metroprolol, pardon me, is a beta 1 selective agent. Propranolol and atenolol are, are not so selective, but they do hit beta 1 receptor or do block beta 1 receptors. So when we block a beta-1 receptor, we would expect to see the heart rate to decrease and the force of contraction to decrease, which would also decrease cardiac output. If we're not choosing a selective agent, we also have to think about what would happen if we block the beta-2 receptors. And the side effect of a blocking of beta-2, or the effect, I should say, of blocking a beta-2 receptor that can potentially get in the way of the utility of these drugs is bronchoconstriction. The other thing that the sympathetic nervous system is responsible, specifically the beta, the the, um, the release of norepinephrine and inhibiting of the beta receptors in the kidneys, is the release of renin and the activation of the angiotensin aldosterone, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Angiotensin is a big time um, is a big time vasoconstrictor. So by blocking beta receptors in the heart and also inhibiting the release of renin, you're going to see less vasoconstriction there. These drugs are pretty well tolerated at lower doses. We, I think traditionally they've moved away from using these as first-line drugs, um, but historically they did use these oftentimes as first-line drugs. They are pretty effective in people with catecholamine-driven hypertension and younger patients specifically. They seem to respond pretty well to these beta receptors, beta blockers, pardon me. Um, at low doses, they're pretty well tolerated. At higher doses, the biggest are the biggest, um, or at even even a long term dose, which most people that go on antihypertensive stay on them. Um, they can be pretty fatigued and have an, um, activity intolerance, and this is going to decrease their heart rate. So at higher doses, we really need to keep an eye on that heart rate <clears throat> and also the rhythm, heart rhythm, because of the beta blockade. Um, oh, I was going to say something about that activity intolerance. So, you know, one of the lifestyle modifications for people that, that have hypertension is to lose weight and get more exercise. And so these drugs can really um, make that challenging because of the fatigue and this intolerance to activity. Um, the GI effects are more or less the same, and those are going to be nausea, vomiting, potentially diarrhea. So we want to be careful with a beta blocker, especially one that's not solely a beta-1 selective agent because um, with patients with either a pre-existing AV block and or asthma. And as I said, they're better for younger patients. Um, one other thing to mention about the beta blockers is you don't want to have someone stop these abruptly because 
that this can cause what we call a rebound hypertension, where um, they their hypertension kind of spikes after you take them off. And that can precipitate angina if they have any predisposition, any coronary artery disease and predisposition towards that. It can lead to a heart attack or sudden death. So if someone does want to take somebody, a patient off of a beta blocker or if a beta blocker does, if a patient doesn't want to remain on a beta blocker, they need to be tapered off over a course of a few weeks generally. All right, so now these are our central drugs. They're not used very frequently. It's definitely not as first-line therapy, but um, they will work, and they will work ultimately by mediating the or modifying the autonomic nervous system, but they're going to do it from the central nervous system down in that respect. So these are really going to be reserved for emergency situations or in really drug-resistant hypertension, the hypertension that's not responding. So again, these were these... One of the drugs that plugs into this category are the alpha-2 agonists. So those are the drugs that I was just talking about. By hitting the alpha-2 receptors in the brain, it decreases the sympathetic outflow peripherally. But these are central nervous system depressants, essentially. So you would expect them to be pretty sedated, pretty dizzy, dry mouth, um, depressed, and pretty significant orthostatic hypotension with these. Um, when they're on this, these for a long time, that can cause um, sodium and water retention as well. Um, and that's probably because if the blood pressure goes way down, the renin, renin is going to be released, right? And that's going to cause the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Aldosterone's job is to, ret- um, is to be responsible for sodium and water reabsorption at the distal tubule. Um, one kind of exception here. It's, you know, a, a kind of a specialized use is methyl dopa. Methyl dopa can be used to treat um, hypertension in pregnancy because it allows for a stable blood flow to the fetus, which is important. And another one notable use here is clonidine. Clonidine is a um, medication that's used um, traditionally as a seizure medication, anti-seizure medication. But clonidine um, has been formulated in a patch, transdermal patch. Um, you can see it listed there, catapress is the name of that patch or that drug in this, in this, um, in this form. And it release, releases slowly over a period of seven days and it seems to have minimal side effects, you know, in terms of the other types of side effects you would expect. Same kind of thing here with, without, with withdrawal. I mean, as a general rule of thumb, you don't generally want to withdraw somebody off of a hypertensive medic- anti-hypertensive medication um, without some caution, but there's some that use a need a little bit more, and this is one of those as well. The big, being, big fear being rebound hypertension, but also quite a bit of c- central nervous system aggravation as well. Here's another kind of a weird drug, and it's interesting just sort of as a historical drug. Um, this is reserpine, approved in 1952. Uh, reserpine is one of the first drugs to treat hypertension, and what it does is it irreversibly binds to norepinephrine storage vesicles, causing norepinephrine to be depleted both centrally and peripherally over time, sort of slowly. It can take a couple weeks for this to happen. So, I mean, just no, thinking of what you know about norepinephrine from our peripheral nervous system conversation, we're essentially depleting norepinephrine over time. So you would expect to see a decrease in sympathetic stimulation at the beta-1 receptors and potentially at the alpha receptors as well. Um, but this is, this, is a, so this is a centrally acting drug. It's going to be, it's a central nervous system depression, depressant, depleting norepinephrine, which is a pretty important neurotransmitter centrally and peripherally for that matter. So lots of sedation, lots of depression, really slows down the heart, lots of hypotension, um, blocking of blocking the sympathetic nervous system. So you're going to see parasympathetic over arching, if you will, right? Remember, this is, there are places where you have dual innervation. If you take the sympathetic out, everything's going to look like you've gotten a heightened parasympathetic response. So as we know, that can be pretty interesting at the gastrointestinal tract, increasing peristalsis, increasing motility, increasing secretions, diarrhea, all that business. And another kind of strange thing is that we oftentimes will see um, nasal congestion, especially early on. So like I said, this is really more historical. You're not going to see this being used, I don't think, ever 
or very infrequently. Um, and it's mainly because it's a CNS depressant. So we don't want to give it to people with, that are already depressed, clearly. We don't want to give it to people who have gastric ulcers because they're potentially already hyper-secreting um, hydrochloric acid in their stomach, and that could be worse, make this worse. General rule of thumb, we generally try not to give anything to pregnant women, but we definitely don't want to give this because it causes respiratory problems in the baby. Okay, I'm going to cut this video just for time here, and I'll pick it up next with the non-autonomic inhibitors of smooth muscle.